Welcome to the Franchise Founders Podcast, where you'll hear right from the source how people like you have been able to buy and build their businesses across different industries all over the country. Dan Claps is the co-founder of Career Transition Leads, Nurture Assist, and Find a Business Online. Christian Dadalak is a franchise consultant with Find a Business Online, and he heads up business development for Career Transition Leads and Nurture Assist. He also runs an independent franchise consulting business, The Franchise Guys. Together, they formed relationships with hundreds of successful business owners who are excited to share their stories with you. Now, here are your hosts, Dan and Christian. All right. Hello, Franchise Founders audience. Excited, very excited for this episode with my good friend, Storm Miller. Hey, Storm, how are you doing? I am well, Dan. Uh, always good to see you. Thank you for having me on. How are you? Yeah, really, really good. Excited to have you on as, as well. Well, Storm doesn't need a ton of introduction in the industry, but I'll give a quick background. Uh, Storm and I met probably, I don't know, six or seven years ago uh, when you were with Benetrends, mm-hmm. now currently the Director of Franchise Development at Repum Group for Forever Young. Storm, you want to give the audience a quick synopsis of your background? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I think above all else, I, I would just consider myself a franchising professional. Um, I've been in the industry now, you know, going on eight years. Mm-hmm. Uh, And and like a lot of people, I I feel like people don't intend to end up in franchising. They kind of stumble into it. uh, And that's my story. Um, So, you know, I I came out of wealth management, um, you know, worked at a couple of different groups uh, and then found myself at at an organization called Benetrends Financial. And and those guys are responsible for providing financing solutions for about 1,200 brands uh, all across North America. Uh, So I was there for five years. Um, you know, ended up running sales and development for that organization uh, the latter half of, of those five years. Uh, and then an opportunity kind of came along uh, to step over the fence uh, and into franchise development, right? And I had previously worked with franchise development professionals for about five years. Uh, so when that opportunity came calling uh, with the Repum Group, which at the time was really a startup, uh, I said, yeah, uh, it would be uh, neat to take part in, in kind of building uh, our own franchise development arm uh, over the, of the organization. And uh, I've been doing that now for the last two and a half years. That's excellent. And you got started with them right at the beginning of, of COVID, no? Right, kind of just COVID hit and then... 100%. Uh, could not have picked uh, a worse time uh, to leave uh, an organization that I was with for five years that treated me extremely well for five years. Uh, I think I had fully transitioned out by like the first or second week of March uh, in 2020, not knowing uh, what was right around the corner uh, with, with COVID uh, getting ready to break out here in the United States. Uh, but uh, at the same time, really gave me an opportunity to sit back uh, and learn an awful lot about this side of the business. And, you know, we've got some really strong professionals. We've got some really strong leadership within the organization. So I was able to take advantage of that uh, during the, uh, the first year uh, of the business, which was operating in uh, kind of untested waters, uh, not just for us, but for everybody. Right. Well, let's speak to that for a second, because our audience is often people that are thinking about, you know, leaving a job that they're working in, often they're a C-suite executive, and they've got a great opportunity that they're in, but they want to make a change. Uh, from my, you know, my experience and not knowing you all these years, Benetrend is a great company. You were doing a great job there. You know, they loved working, you know, having you on their team and, you know, on the internal team. Um, what you can you speak to kind of what drove the decision and, and how you navigated, it's never easy leaving a great opportunity for another one. How did you navigate that thought process? And then how did you communicate it with everyone involved? So I think uh, you could probably say that part of it was drinking the Kool-Aid, uh, you know, after five years of working with people, that were leaving corporate America jobs to start a business of their own, to try and succeed uh, on their own and not necessarily always on their own, right? That's why the franchising model, that's why the franchise industry exists. Uh, I think that was something that I became interested in, right? And at the time, you know, Repum Group was mostly a real estate project management firm, right? They were managing uh, build out and, and construction for a number of different franchise systems, right? So they were really focused on helping uh, franchise brands who had sold franchise licenses actually open physical locations uh, within those territories. Uh, And then we were starting 
uh, to have some of those brands, you know, reach out to us to, to talk about franchise development, right? Actually a, a franchise sales arm of the business uh, and the opportunity uh, to step in and, and really help us establish that side of the business came about. Um, and I was officially employee number two uh, in uh, the franchise development business. Uh, so we've been able to, to kind of grow the business really from scratch. Um, number of people that were already a part of the organization had pretty significant experience uh, in franchise development themselves. Uh, you know, I had worked with those individuals in the past, um, you know, actually financing the franchisees of the brands that they were running development for. Uh, so a lot of things seemed to be coming together and it was, you know, an opportunity that uh, almost seemed like destiny, if you will. Yeah, I you know commend, commend Nick and Rob, you know, the, the team that they put together and as they spent the time. I think I remember you joined their team with really no brands yet to for you to represent and, and they knew that the opportunity to work with you was, was too important not to let go go by. Well, like I said, right? So at the time I had fully transitioned away and, and into uh, Repum uh, in mid-March. And we were in the process of bringing on a brand that I am now working with, which is Forever Young Anti-Aging Solutions. You actually just interviewed our co-founders uh, a couple yeah. of weeks back. Um, but once the pandemic kind of began, they had to put that onboarding process on the back burner with us, right? They had locations of their own that they were forced to close. Uh, they had a couple of franchisees that were already open that they had to support. And to be honest with you, I think that speaks volumes about the brand that was the right decision to make, right? We've got to take care of our own. We've got to figure out what we're going to be doing within our own corporate locations. We also have three franchisees that we need to support, right? They're going to be closing their doors. We need to be able to communicate with them. And when they are able to reopen, we've got to help mm. them almost relaunch the business altogether. Um, so it was the right decision, but, uh, you know, I had to sit idle uh, for just a little bit. Uh, and then uh, as, you know, kind of summer, came about. Uh, we were able to continue that process. And here's the deal, right? There's a process that we take our brands through at Repum Group, right? We don't just uh, sign an agreement to partner with a brand and then take them to market right away, right? That's not how we do things. So we needed to make sure that we understand uh, the brand before we go ahead mm. uh, and begin offering the franchise opportunity through the Repum Group. And that's a process that can take, you know, three to six months. And that's exactly what we did. We took them through our process, uh, and officially took over franchise development in January of 2021. That's excellent. So talking on, you know, a client that, or someone on this podcast that's listening, they got a great job. They've got a great relationship with their managers, but they're thinking about signing, you know, leaving that job and signing that franchise agreement. Could you talk to like, what was the conversation? Like, how did you approach, you know, making that change? You know, because obviously it's, it wasn't easy deciding. It's not. Um, I, I think the most important thing is trusting the people that you're going to be working with, right? Uh, and, and for anybody that's considering, you know, stepping away from a corporate America job and into a franchise system, get to know the team that you're going to be working with, right? If your franchise agreement is a 10-year agreement, that's a 10-year marriage. You're going to want to be comfortable with that partner. Uh, that's part of the reason that we host all of our discovery days in person. We believe in that. We're a little bit more old school uh, in that regard. But we want to be able to, to look people in the eye, shake their hands, uh, and we want for both parties to recognize that, yes, this is somebody that I see myself doing business with for yeah. the next 10 years, right? And if yeah. there's an option to renew that franchise agreement, it could be for 15, it could be for 20 years. Um, yeah. But I, I think that's part of, that, that has to be part of your decision-making process. You have to have trust uh, that the franchisor um, is going to work with you. Uh, is going to communicate with you, is going to support you. Uh, and you should also be making sure that a franchise brand's strengths help make up for your own personal weaknesses, right? Yeah. You should complement one another uh, in that way. And, and if that's the case, it, it makes making that decision that much more easier. Right. Yeah. You know, there's a, it, there's a great book that I just recently read that talks about this idea. And in this case, it's the franchisor and, uh, and the franchisee but in other cases, it's the business partnership. It's a book called Rocket Fuel. And what it's about is you've got the, and I don't like the term because the one term sounds so sexy and cool and the other one doesn't, but you've got the visionary and you've got the integrator, right? In a business, whether it's the franchisor and the franchisee or two business partners or CEO, COO. 
and really the visionary, which again, that's such a like broadcasted title, but it, you know, it means someone that, you know, is key relationships, casting the vision, big picture, you know, going out and hunting new business and, and developing the process. And then this, the, the integrator, which is just as important and just as cool, right, is the person that's, you know, managing the KPIs, keeping the team going, you know, maybe they're more attention to detail. I know I need an integrator because I, I lack that, that area. But yeah. um, when someone gets into a franchise, they've got that, all of that already locked in and they've even got a, a manual to follow to, to continue to do that. Yeah. Um, but that's very interesting. Build the so right team around. You. Build the right team, yeah. So you, so you jumped into to, to, to Rep and Brew, never looked back. You, you guys are obviously, you know, doing a tremendous amount of, of placements across all of your brands. About ready to bring on another director uh, of franchise development as well. Um, so uh, that announcement uh, should be coming in uh, the next couple of weeks, we hope. Um, but, you know, uh, took him through the interview process and his interview process actually involved him uh, coming out to a discovery day. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully continuing to grow the team here in, uh, in 2022. And now that's for another uh, representative. That's for one of the brand. brands in our inventory. A, di a different brand. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I know for me, I went through a re somewhat recently, I went through that same, uh, you know, juncture of my life. I value work. I love to work. I, I work seven, six, seven days a week. I've still got plenty of time with my family, but you know, just last night I was up till three in the morning working on some, some things. It's who I am. Yep. But I also value uh, the decision, right? The decision of when I'm going to work, if I'm going to work, if I'm not going to work, it's still probably going to choose working, but it's a choice for me. That's important. I value that freedom. Um, and I think that a lot of people that are listening to this episode or this podcast they may end up working 20 hours more a week in the business than their corporate job, but they're potentially going to be more fulfilled because they're working on what they want to be working on for themselves and their family. Yeah. They reap the benefits of that hard work. That that's the reason that that's, that's part of the American dream. Right. Uh, and I think that's what you have uh, here in this country, sometimes more so here than in, in other countries is the opportunity uh, to build a legacy for yourself uh, to build um, you know, wealth uh, for yourself, for your families. And, and there's kind of a pathway to experiencing a little bit more, not just financial freedom, uh, but, yeah. but just freedom in life. Um, you you kind of get that through franchising. Uh, and you hear the success stories all the time, right? Uh, every franchisee, right, no matter how large uh, they really are, they all start with just a, a single franchise, right? There's, there's kind of that one business yeah. Uh, that that launches them into an entirely different stratosphere. So uh, we're hoping to see some of that same, um, you know, story within our own franchise system at Forever Young. I, I think that's that's a place we'll eventually get to. Yeah. You know, it, it, we were talking before that we started the, the podcast about, you know, the economic climate. And, you know, the, the, obviously, everyone was thinking about the potential or probably imminent, you know, recession that's coming. Um you know, I was, thinking, I was just reading an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that talked about uh, class of 2022. Like, we think we had it good, or people say millennials, they had it, you know, so easy, and, and you know, the jobs are more abundant. Um, look at 2022. I'm reading articles about there's employers building houses for their, their employees. I think Walt Disney Company is one of them that where they were literally building houses for their 2022 graduates. These kids are coming out of school with pretty much the entire driver's seat of employment of, of making a decision where, where they're going to work. And I was having this conversation with my dad, which was every generation is supposed to get easier than the last. So you can't be frustrated because I find that with sometimes an older generation, they'll get frustrated with like our generation that we have it easier. We should, right. And we have it harder in other ways, but I like to think that, you know, the generation uh, after us and someday our kids, it should get easier for them, not, not harder. Um, but what do you think is, is pending? You know, what do you think is coming as far as the economic climate? So I think the next, you know, year or two is going to be really interesting um, to evaluate for the franchise industry, right? You know, you've got so many of these leading indicators out there in the economy that show we're heading towards a recession, right? If you look at the market today, it's not, 
not performing well. Uh, I don't want to look at my IRA. I don't want to look at my 401k <laughs> uh, because the market is, is selling off, right? So, you know, we're, we're heading a, into a little bit of a recession. And for some people in corporate America, you know, this is going to be the second time uh, in, you know, two, three, four years that they may see some consolidation within their own organizations, right? If the economy uh, starts to backtrack a little bit, you're going to see some layoffs. You're going to see some consolidation. You're going to see, you know, more outsourcing of, of different positions. This isn't the first time I would have seen this in, in franchising, by the way. You know, I, I experienced it when I was at Benetrends. Uh, but it'll be the first time that I've ever seen it where you might have some people who are laid off not just once in two to three years, it might be twice. Uh, and I think what you're going to see is that, you know, the job isn't as, it's not as steady uh, as people would like for it to be. Um, you know, corporate America uh, is not the dream for everybody. Um, it, it certainly is a little bit more volatile. Uh, it's, it's more volatile in, in these times. Um, and, and I think what you might start to see is that some people that may have had the urge to look into starting something on their own, this might be the nudge that they need uh, to take that step uh, and, you know, maybe reach out to a franchise brand, right? Something that they're interested in, maybe take that step to reach out to a franchise consultant to find out, hey, what opportunities are available in my market? I think we're going to see a little bit more of that uh, over the next year or two. Absolutely. I agree. I mean, I, I know for us, we've, we've not really seen much of a, a you know, a stagnation in, in franchise candidates. I think in the month of April, finding business online did like third, just 31 territories in, in April. Um, but we also have a bigger team. So it's, it's really all relative. Um, but we've got know, a few uh, more licenses we should be adding to that list, by the way, but uh, we'll reserve that for another time. Yeah, oh, excellent. Excellent for the May and June list. But um you know, I was, I was having a conversation that I, I think that people are going to start to, especially as offices, if people are starting to get brought back into the office, we were just having a conversation on much we both work, you know, we love working from our, our computers. Um, I think as you see it, people are getting pulled back into offices. That's also going to be another, uh, you know, determination if, if that people start looking at businesses as well. And, you know, businesses are not just food and fitness and, and, and services, right? The home services has grown obviously a great space, but now you've got things like Forever Young and Elemental Health. You've got all these new industries that are starting to, well, not new industries, but new franchise opportunities within industries. And to that point, corporate America is going through an evolution, right? Everybody's been exposed to remote work because of the pandemic, oh. right? You and I are, are fully remote employees. Uh, I have not gone into the Charlotte office uh, for the Repum group, with the exception of a handful of meetings that I've had down there, right? I, I have a little bit more autonomy over my day. Uh, but then again, the work helps manage our own days. Um, but you've had people that uh, now have built lives around remote work. Uh, they like that autonomy. They like that work-life balance. Uh, and, and I think for you know some of the major employers out there that are pushing their employees to come back into the office, um, they're fighting what I deem inevitable, uh, which is that corporate America and, and the workplace is going to move uh, to mostly remote. Uh, I think you're going to see that over the next 10 years. Um, I, I saw an, in, uh, an interview that the CEO of uh, Airbnb gave where he talked about that. Um, and he said, listen, we're not going to require employees to come back in. Uh, we like uh, how productive our employees are at home. We like that they feel they have a work-life balance. We've eliminated commutes. Uh, we've eliminated certain things and, and it's allowed people to build uh, families, um, you know, and, and that's the route that they're going. They're not going to require people to come back in. And it also makes a lot of sense for a company like Airbnb to say that given that, you know, what their business model is, right? Uh, and it's, you know, subleasing space out really. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And, and there might be a little bit of, of headbutting in corporate America for companies that require the employees to come back into the office full time. Well, you have to look at the time, right? Right now you've got this moment in work where we've got four generations all in the workplace. You've got baby boomers and, and down to Gen Z, right? So you got across the gamut. And I was just reading another article that was talking about basically every couple of generations, there's this massive shift in generation of, of, of different. So for us as millennials, drastically different than baby boomers and, you know, the more mature generations. Um, 
Gen X, et cetera. Um, us and Gen Z, from what I was reading, are not that different. There's obviously differences, yeah. but we were born in the, you know, in the same, you know, technology era. Yep. And but when you look at it, you've got this massive difference in thought process, belief system, experience from top level management to now millennials that are in mid level management and, and top level management as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, millennials so, are hitting the C suite. Uh, right. and, and again, to your point, that is going to change corporate America. Um, and for a lot of us millennials, like I have, I have siblings that are in Gen Z. Um, now I grew up right at the time where we were going through major technological innovation. It wasn't already there for me, but as I kind of grew up in, in my developmental years, technology continued to improve, right? And it connected people, uh, for the next generation down. That's all they know. It's been there their whole life. Um, but I can... I can probably understand that a little bit better than most because I, I have siblings that grew up like that. Uh, I've got a sibling who asked me what a VHS tape was and my knees buckled uh, because that was never a part of his life. Um, yeah. But it was a part of mine. Uh, and, and now, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the world that we live in. But see, and, and all the, first of all, millennials is a dirty word, right? Like, unfortunately, people just think of it as like this entitled generation doesn't work hard. But I was actually on a, a, a summit recently and they were taught, I don't know, the, remember the exact details, but there was a quote that said, no one wants to work hard, everyone's lazy, and everyone's writing a book these days. And the presenter asked what um, generation said this, what year was this? It turned out, you would think like maybe the 90s or the 80s or now, this was, bef- this was 2,000 years ago that this person said, the new generation, no one wants to work, they're lazy, everyone's writing a book. Basically, every generation thinks of the prior, uh, you know, the predecessor generation to be, um, lazy. So it's, it's just, it's human nature to think this way. Um, I thought that was interesting, but you know, a millennial, I think, what is it? 81, 1981, uh, everything after. So they're you know, in their early forties. So yeah, they're, they're moving into C-suite roles or even, you know, higher roles at this point. Yep. So they're making the decisions on, on what happens. And the millennial generation is a rather large generation, right? I think it encompasses something like 16 years, right? So you're going you're gonna to have people who have very different upbringings that are still all a part of, of that same generation. Uh, but to your point, I, I do think it will continue to revolutionize corporate America. Um, you know, we, we have certain things at our disposal that previous generations did not. Um, and the easiest example of that is the fact that you and I are doing a podcast right now with you being in uh, Manhattan and I am in Royersford, Pennsylvania. Um, and yeah. this is going to be super easy for you and I. Uh, probably not something that was possible, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting because like, I, I know for me, like, I'm a millennial, but I have, my parents had me later in life. So my dad's about to be 70, right? So, and, and from Brooklyn, uh, Italian immigrant, you know, grandmother. So, you know, we have that, um, stereotyping of course but the italian culture like working is like such a uh an identity and then you couple yeah. that with some catholic yeah, guilt true. yeah right and so, some catholic guilt and you, you know you work you're a workaholic i think that's where it comes from maybe but um i'm just kidding but um i always say you can mix both you can learn from your parents and their generation and take all the good and all the good of your generation and, and mix them together that's a great opportunity right because if you think about having the work ethic but also the entitlement which could also mean ambition and ability to ask for what you want and go after it those th- those two things are you know will always mesh well together yeah and i think organizations will you know have to continue to be creative um to build loyalty to the own organization and and to also make sure morale stays high right if you if you are uh, an organization of of fully remote employees right like I think we have directors at the rep home group. We have directors and VPs that live in, I don't know, six to eight different states. Um, I mean, we're all over the place. We only have, I think right now, one director that lives uh, in Charlotte uh, and, and that's Ashley. Um, so we, we've come up with creative ways uh, by getting people out to different events and, and doing some team building um, and doing some bonding as an organization that, that keeps that bond strong. It's how we continue to move forward as, as an organization. 
yeah, you guys have a great, great team. So, you know, you, you get together off site or in, in an office and, you know, spend that time building camaraderie and you go back to your, your silos and, and work. You know, I had this experience during COVID. I was, uh, I was going against the grain. I thought I'm the business owner. I'm the one who made all the sacrifices. You have to come in. You got to work. It's my terms. I'm the, and this was a wrong way of thinking, but this was, you know, a way of thinking. And I had to shift my mindset to wait. What if you just start to realize that the team that you're hiring is doing all the work for you? They're making the business happen. They're they're making your vision come to reality. Shouldn't that be the opposite then? Shouldn't you really be working to serve them, give Absolutely. them what they want so they're happy? And when I shifted that mindset, I found that finding people became I was having trouble finding people. Now I can find people no problem because you're giving them in. what they need. Yeah, they're yep. coming to me, right? And, you know, I, I was pretty flexible when I managed a, a, a team of consultants, right? So at one point, I, I was managing a team of, of 13 consultants. Uh, and again, they were in five different states, but we had a core group that was coming into the office. And I used to give them, you know, that flexibility uh, to work remote. This is even before, this is prior to the pandemic. You can work remote. I'd love to see you in the office. Uh, I'll be here uh, just about every day. Um, so we'd love to see you here. I'd love to help you out. Uh, you know, my door's always open. And, and we used to kind of look at trends. And, you know, for the younger consultants, what was funny to see was, you know, they were still kind of grappling with having that level of freedom, that level of autonomy uh, over their day. And uh, on the months that they would spend a little bit more time remote, you would see their their production go down a little bit. And what I would say is, well, you know, if, if your production's down a little bit, let's make sure you're in the office, right? Let's instead of only being in the office one to two days a week, let's see in here three to four. And then all of a sudden, you know, their production would go back up and I would say, okay, well now you have a little bit more freedom, you know, you know, let's go back to two to three days uh, a week remote. And then you see the production drop a little bit. Right. So it's all about kind of being able to look back and, and being self-aware enough to say, Hey, I do well with this freedom or Hey, I do not do so well with this freedom. Right. And I think as long as what's in your heart is that you want the best for the individual, um, you know, you become an effective leader. Yeah, and, and if you have, you know, if you have to babysit an employee, then they're not the right fit. And the reality is most people, they want to do a good job. Very few people wake up and go, I want to do a bad job today. I want the company to, to, to not do well. That's not human nature. When people are motivated, which really motivation comes down to five categories, or you've got, you know, respect, recognition, um, challenge, right? The, um, some autonomy in the decisions, being a part of the results, seeing that their work provides results to them. If you give people these four or five uh, attributes at any given time, if you're missing one, it's like you're missing all of them. But if you've got all five, people are happy to work. And you know, I think about uh, we have a, our operations manager, Michelle. She um, she has family in Portugal, and I'll never forget the first year working. She said, "I need to go to Portugal for three weeks, but I'd like to keep working." You know, she had a, a death in the family of someone very close. And I nicely said, if you go to Portugal, and I don't know, I don't, I don't want to hear the Wi-Fi or this isn't working. If you go and I don't feel like you're there, I don't care if you go every summer. And yeah. she went, she figured out how to make it happen. There was never an excuse that I'm in Portugal. She made it happen. And she goes, I mean, other than COVID, she's been going every summer. I don't care if you're in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Bora Bora, if you're on your computer and you're working, it doesn't matter. Now, on the other end, I once had an, uh, a teammate where uh, I don't care if you're in a hotel by the beach during the business hours, but I would, I, would, I would call her and I could hear something didn't sound right. So I FaceTimed her and she was on the beach. That to me is not, uh, I guess you could argue you could work on the beach. To me, that's pushing a little far, um, but who cares where you are if you're in front of your computer? Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't want to work physically on the beach. Put me on a boardwalk, looking at the beach, watching the waves roll in and out, and, and I'm game. I could do that all day. Yeah. I guess, I guess it depends on, you know, obviously sales is easier to work remote. Um, but there are some roles that do need to be in, in the office, but um, I think it's very few and far between, to be honest with you, at this yeah. point. Yeah, you can plug in from just about anywhere uh, nowadays. So tell me, what, what are you expecting out of your own organization? Because you guys have grown, you know, pretty substantially yeah. uh, over the last couple of years. You've brought on some really quality franchise consultants. What's the next step uh, for your business? 
Yeah, so we've, uh, you know, very fortunate career transition leads. I see you got the cup there. That's that's excellent. Uh, career transition leads and, and all the departments within that company, Nurture Assist and Find a Business Online, um, recently all became uh, more of a uh, larger part of the uh, internal IFPG organization. So, yeah, I'm sure you're aware, you know, if you're listening, you know, IFPG was fortunate enough to have a um, strategic investment from Princeton Equity Group to allow for future growth. And so the plan is to utilize that capital to, you know, build the infrastructure, hire uh, a stronger leadership team, um, and, you know, put, put energy into making the pro- all the product offerings stronger. So very excited to, to see that happen. Um, I think that IFPGs just kind of scratched the surface of the opportunity. Uh, young company, only 10 years old. Career transition is just about six years old, so a lot of opportunity there to grow as well. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see the, the hires that get made and, and the future of what we'll be doing. Yeah. Yeah, you guys have, I, I, I mean, I've had a chance to kind of sit back uh, and watch, um, you know, you and, and Don and Red and, and some of the things you guys have done to grow IFPG. Uh, and it's, it's been nothing short of impressive. Uh, over the last few years, and, and you guys have made a, a great partner uh, to Repa uh, and, and the brands in our portfolio, um, of which there are five uh, right now, uh, but currently working to bring on uh, two or three more. We're, we're hoping we have them ready to launch um, sometime in Q3 or Q4 of this year. And how many, so, so one last question, how, how many people are on your, your team at Repa Group? How many people are, are there totally employees? So... You know, as you know, if, if you, you know, sat in on um, the uh, podcast with Rob and Nick, uh, there are four different verticals uh, within Repo, right? And it's brand them, grow them, build them, and scale them. Um, I tell you right now, you know, the build them arm is probably the largest, uh, you know, division of the organization. Um, the original right? and the original model of the business, right? Exactly. Um, they, they've, they, they're the side of the business that has, uh, been in operation the longest, right? And it, they've grown the most substantially um, over that time. Um, but I would, if, if I had to guess between those four verticals, probably 50 employees or so uh, that, that are a part of the organization. Uh, and we continue to grow. Um, you know, at the end of last year, I want to say we were probably somewhere around 25, uh, 30 employees. We continue to bring on new directors, wow. new people in branding, new people in real estate and construction, uh, we've got a few people um, kind of sitting in the bullpen that we might be able to bring on to the operations side of the business, um, but we continue to grow ourselves. Um, and, and fortunately, you know, really, when, when you look at our value add to uh, franchisors, we help them navigate the growing pains that are associated with growing a franchise system. So, you know, we experience some of that ourselves, uh, but we also think that with the people uh, that have built the organization, uh, we're, we're pretty well tooled uh, to navigate those waters as as we grow out Repl. That's excellent. Wish you guys nothing but continued success and working together. Um, well, there you have it, guys. Thank you, Storm Miller, for joining. Of course. Of course, it was my pleasure, Dan. Always, uh, always great to reconnect. If someone wants to get in contact with you, what would be the best way? Uh, probably uh, via email. Um, so I have a super simple email address. Uh, it is s miller at repmgroup.com that is r-e-p-m group.com uh you can reach me uh via email at any time because like you uh i tend to be plugged in uh you know across a number of different hours throughout the day excellent thank you